Vanish. Then I have chosen to perform this. Now, which component team you should I choose? Now, I'm, now I'm looking at the black hole again. So this picture here. Things going in. So this is the black hole. This is outer space. Maybe one. There are things going into the black hole. Which the outer black hole. I can now choose one component of the metric tensor, of the optic edge of the tensor, to vanish. Let's choose that all the outgoing particles vanish. The outgoing particles are described by G minus minus, which is also if in, in a local vertical order that, that is identified with G plus plus if, if you place a lower index by an upper index the plus with minus components. Again this is light of order of course uh, you can say that, that this thing is um, uh, z, z uh, minus g z t plus <coughs> yeah plus g t t and so on. But um, so in space time in this component, the map of order is just g minus minus. We have b plus g minus minus is zero or b plus g plus plus two to so um, that's just an energy conservation for for T you know. So the same thing for G as for T. Um, so it means that G minus minus is only a function, is not a function of X plus, so G minus minus is only a function of X minus. Because D D X plus vanishes. So being only a function of G minus <coughs> minus means that it is this kind of things from a distance, they are constant in the plus dimension, but they are some function of the minus dimension. And if I impose the condition g minus minus is zero, it means I have no outgoing particles. I'm looking at a black hole that doesn't radiate anything. That's the vision of someone traveling into a black hole. Because traveling into a black hole doesn't see the whole particles. So he is working in a conformal gauge where G minus minus, the lower indices minus, vanishes. Conversely, of course, we can look at the observer who only sees the whole particles but has no information about the incoming things. That observer will have G plus plus vanish. So from the gauge of G minus minus zero, I want the gauge of G plus plus is zero. And that's a conformal translation. Just because um, if this is zero, I might, I might still have particles going in. If, if I, I move the particles in, I have particles going out. So this is a transformation that affects my conformal gauge, so to speak. And uh, so now I see that what I did here as a transformation of the scalable space of incoming particles to do it with upper particles, I now here in, in, interpret that as a conformal transformation. And that's why I think that conformal gravity could help me in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of, of physics. So this is what I want to say about conformal gravity. And, uh, then, uh, I want to continue with its consequence for particle physics because now you might have thought that I'm rendered away so far from the real world I'm discussing uh, strange transformations in, on the horizon of a black hole what could it have to do with the real world? Well, this is also why I walk down all these things on the blackboard and I walk down something here and this of course is in a very compactified notation by description of the standard model in a generally curved space time where you have a, a, a Ricci scalar field present. And I add a Ricci scalar term for the scalar fields. That makes the theory obviously performing there. Now again, as I said, this is a trivial symmetry. So if I plug this into the standard model, in particular for the mass terms, something very interesting happens. So if I do this here, this is potentially P, 
something very interesting happens, and that is that um, uh, the mass terms at first sight are not performing very well. It must have been thought that maybe some field theories are performing invariant if particles have masses that breaks perform invariant. Well, not here, because this I mean, was a term of symmetry. So, but of course, what happens when you add a mass term, normally, uh, in theory, that mass term, this transformation alone leaves the whole Lagrange in invariant. Now that's no longer true, and the reason is that I have this, this little all over here. So I replaced G mu by G mu hat, but I still have this over the square form. So what happens with the standard model is that in particular the term plus mu squared phi squared in the Higgs potential. The Higgs potential has this particular shape. And what goes up here is the quantity component. So the V of phi equals log of phi fourth, forget for a moment the coefficient front, minus mu squared phi squared, and then and, and minus v <coughs> in the Lagrangian, so that's why I wrote here plus. Forget for a moment the factors one half, uh, one fourth, and two or so. Uh, basically, what I want is here's a coupling constant, here's another coupling constant, here's a sign. This gives you the gravity, and this gives you the bump in the middle. And uh, the normal story is that the Higgs field gets this vacuum and rotation vacuum. But that, you would say, cannot be performed in that. Well, in this theory, it is, but what happens is that in here, the square root of g cancels out. If I transform the vector tension, if this is 5 to the fourth, I'll get the 5 to the fourth divided by lambda to the fourth. But the um, Square of the G of fourth gives me a lot of the fourth as well. So the lot that then cancels out, and that means that this quantum term here is conforming invariant all by itself. But not the mass term. The mass term only becomes conforming invariant if I remember that I put the omega square there, so I put here omega square. And that's actually, because it's only the fast square, it goes with the lot square. G, G itself is the lot of the fourth. So there's something missing, and what's missing is if you make the substitution, you get the field omega squared in here. And that is just part of, of gravity. So now the thing becomes obviously performing there, but I have to rewrite this as a plus mu squared. And then there will be some kappa because I have the uh, omega is kappa times i eta, so there will be a kappa squared. And then there will be a phi squared, eta squared. And now eta has been promoted to be a dynamical variable. Before, we just had that eta was minus i over kappa tilde. And uh, that's just a constant, basically. And we can all choose a gauge such as eta constant. But now eta is a dynamical field, although it is not a dynamical transformation, it's a dynamical field. And so, with that lambda field, this term is conforming there again. This is a quantum interaction, phi squared interacts with theta squared. And this is the interaction between the coefficients. Now, kappa is very, very small, um, so that uh, this term, this coefficient in terms of this term, is actually very tiny. That is a statement that the Higgs mass is actually very small compared to the Planck mass, the fundamental mass scale. Or I'm talking about here. So this is actually a very, very small coefficient, saying that there is a mixing between the Higgs field phi and the eta field eta. And uh, although I said that the eta has this reference value, uh, value, because we are mixing the phi, we also have the vector value. And that's just f, and it's much, much smaller than this. So, um, uh, but altogether, I think it's not. So this way, I turn artificially, I turn stand on to a completely conforming invariant theory. So um, I started writing down the action of standard model, and now I see that in particular here we get a minus lambda plus the fourth and minus uh, mu squared kappa squared. 
5 strand, 8 strand. So here the field eta occurs, mixes with the other fields in the standard model. Whereas before, okay, I didn't add that in this, I would also have to put monotonal the eta strand, and then there would be um, a, a minus one total by eta uh, squared as well, as usual. So that's the same as for the five field. And I might want to add a cosmological term, which gives me a lambda eta to the fourth. So eta also has self interaction if there's a cosmological term, right? And there's a cup squared lambda eta to the fourth. But gamma is small and lambda is extremely small. So this is again a very, very tiny quartic self interaction of the eta field. So that's also there in, in the standard model if I add the. Um, uh, the gravitational effects. So now my theory is formally performing in that more or less by construction. Um, oh yes, what I wanted to add to this is a very important remark here to understand how the whole thing is structured. This theory now includes gravity, but there seems to be something missing or nearly missing, which is the original einstein Hubert term. How? How can I derive Einstein's equation if I don't see the term uh, that, that we normally have in uh, gravity, which is this? Well, I can say this term is present. It is in this very tiny performer interaction, my one term r eta square. Eta square tells you that the thing has dimension, neutral constant has dimension, therefore it's not in the depth of eta. And this actually is what's left of the Einstein term. But now, uh, if you rearrange things, you see that really this is just part of the kinetic term of the eta field. So you could also say, well, I consider this to be a small connection. This is a common term interested in. Eta is just the field as energy as the Higgs field. So now we have to, to uh, rephr rephrase the formalities of the theory. And I emphasize it's a, it's a formality, it's just doing the bookkeeping differently from what we usually do, but we end up describing exactly the same physics. So um, I still haven't really addressed much the physical problems of the theory, I've only addressed the description of it. And the description is that now uh, we don't see an isomeric term, and we can add the kinetic energy the T mu of the standard model, let's say, we add the T minimum of the eta field. And that was the rule that, that uh, we added. And then you see that if you add that, then this term is just part of the term of the eta field, and shouldn't be, have, be used as, as an item term anymore. So normally we say maybe the Einstein equation gives you this is our G minimum hat. With the usual coefficients described by Einstein's equation, that's not right because th th there's no, the Einstein Hilbert term has disappeared. So it is this times the coefficient involving the Einstein Hilbert term, which is zero. So actually, you have to say this is not the new equation. The new equation is that these two things cancel out against each other. The element tensor of the conformal invariant theory I'm looking at here has to be imposed to be zero. What are the equations? And well, remember that I had, I had uh, the equations for the eta field, I did not yet have the equations of the and mu. So now we have to rephrase the formalities to the equations that we are using. Instead of imposing Einstein equations in the usual way, we say g mu is now determined by the extra condition then the energy of the tensor scale more plus the energy of the tensor theta of the eta field vanishes. Actually, this equation is Einstein's equation in this guy. Because really, if you calculate this, this is just g So now I say I is minus g mu. Why minus? Is this a negative uh, energy of the tensor? Well, yes, because I have I have to an I in the definition of eta. I'm just going to raise it. Oh, it's still here. This I here tells you the eta field. Is negative, it contributes negatively to the energy and momentum 
And so, so this term actually is a negative term, minus g mu, and that tells you that g mu of gravity is t mu of the standard model, and that is just a familiar Einstein equation. But now you see that instead of writing Einstein equation, I, I promote the g mu to be a, a, a contribution of the energy of the tensor of the theory. And then I can just Einstein equation just plot this whole from this whole lot together as up to zero. So I haven't changed the physics, but I've changed the description of it. I, instead of writing g mu, I say that that's just t mu of the eight of it. And that, um, so, so, so that interpretation works out nicely. So now you understand how to handle the Lagrangian principle. You just impose some arbitrarily chosen GNAT. And then we let the matter fields do whatever they want to do according to those equations. And I calculate t mu the standard model plus t mu the eta field. If that doesn't cancel out to zero, in a particular given initial conditions I chose, I, I realize I've chosen the wrong GNAT. Try again, insert the correct GNAT until these two things completely cancel out. So that's now the rule of the game. And of course, I've been describing what you have to do next time, so I'm sensitive to the other So it, it's all just a question of wording. But I like to work things this way. And, um, um, uh, this basically tells you that in the case of the black hole, there are also gravitons going in and out. And uh, well, I'm going to add those. But eventually, it all, it, it, it all should add up to zero if you do it right. So the ingoing particles of theory combine with the ingoing gravitons of theory to, to make some differences. And uh, uh, so now, I don't know if I have questions about this because I'm now going to a slightly different chapter. I'm now going to see what effect this has on the standard model. Can I, can yes. I ask a question? Uh, I don't understand. Uh, the eta field uh, is in principle a complex, and then uh, that's why it <coughs> is allowed to take an imaginary um, expectation value. Yes. So the, this is. Uh, the eta field is entirely imaginary. It has an I in front of everything as compared to other fields. And that's why the expectation value is I times something. And that's unusual in field theory, I have to admit that. But it, it's just a constant. And it, so putting that constant imaginary gives you ordinary physics back. So I'm rephrasing ordinary physics as well as I can, keeping the mathematics apart from, uh, from the equation looking a bit different, the real content, the physical content of the mathematical equation is exactly the same as usual. But now I see that the price I pay for doing that is that I have to keep an eye in the application value of the data. And in itself is, is totally imaginary the field, at least according to conventional physics. And that, that's why we get an application like this, because TV <laughs> normally is bound to be low. TV obeys inequality, say, and the energy density is positive, and pressure, well, chemical and magnetic usually depends on the properties of these matter fields. But now we see the energy density of the eta field is by definition negative. That's a well-known statement that the energy density of the gravitational field is also negative. So there are minus signs all over the place there. And um, so the fact that you can obey this equation is you know, no longer surprising. Just you know, if eta field, if oh, if the gravitational field would happen to have the other sign, if gravity would have been repulsive, then this all would be very different. Because then the gravitons would have a negative energy density all by themselves, and they would have a minus sign. Well, uh, the eta field would become a real field, and then uh, it would be impossible to obey this, this condition. So uh, I would be in, in all sorts of, of trouble. Um, um, uh, as you put it, uh, it is some, uh, we can consider it as a correction of the gravitation. Sorry? We can uh, consider it as a correction to the gravitation. It's not a correction. correction. It, is, it, is, it represents uh, the it, it, it is the, conf the conformal part of the, of, of the metal tensor, as you can see there. So, 
and, and that is a, a very special component of the that I'm singling out. Mm -hmm. So that that part, without a surprise, you have made as a renormalized ophidium. We thought gravity is not renormalized, well, that's true, but the, but the, the tenth component, so to speak, in the sense is still renormalized. So the eighth field is exactly as handled as the next field. Yes, but now let me see the Lagrangian has been reshaped. And now this is my Lagrangian, the standard model is the top line, and then I add the eight of you, this really comes from the eyes and lower term, and the cosmological term. And, 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 and uh, but now the eyes and lower term react for the eight of you, it looks as if it turns the eight of you to completely renormalizable action. So, so that part seems to be so nice that I think a lot of deserve extra attention. Sorry, I'm confused, but the G hat is still a dynamic of field. You didn't freeze. So G hat, so this is the most difficult part. Yeah. How do I adjust G hat such that this equation comes out to me? And you know, I attempted to say maybe we have to look at the aggregation value of this. That's the So maybe G hat is classical in a sense. That can't be completely right. The electrons uh, will eventually be quantum particles. So this eta will uh, well, I don't understand that part extremely well, so it can't be a completely classical condition. It is conditioned in the function of the law. So, uh, so this is a common condition on G hat. I don't think one should put that in some it. So, and, and that makes this condition still very difficult. Uh, and, and of course, all the difficulties you have in common gravity are on this line. Well, how, how do I adjust G hat such that the, the element that in the Hilbert space completely cancels out? And uh, you also have to remember, of course, the equation of non-linear. So if the equation of linear, you would see that um, that uh, saying that varying the um, G hat should, uh, well, jihad is still a field that wants to be integrated, whereas jihad only occurs in these equations indirectly. So it occurs, of course, in this R, and normally that's the way we really handle that. Field. Now, if this R is not a dominant term, then jihad is very, is very well hidden in this Lagrangian. Yet you have to insist that uh, if you differentiate with respect to uh, to G minu, the G minu of the action should vanish. But that's a classic equation, you have to watch out. Quantum mechanically, what you really have to say, well, you have to do the function integral of G hat, all linear terms will, uh, at first sight, uh, at first approximation, get this, but the quadratic terms tell you that the situation is more complicated. So the actual linear terms give me directly this equation. But it has to be done as a quantum equation, and there are non-linear terms. So, reality is more complicated than that of our mechanism. And um, uh, so, this basically was the quantum, the quantum limit of something. But the classical limit of something is quantum mechanical and more complicated. Anyway, I thought that uh, I would show you this way of, of rephrasing. Gravity as a uh, modifying theory of, of the standard model with an extra period in it. And now comes a very important line. This eta field is so similar to the Higgs field, maybe it is just a meta field. Why, why should there be a fundamental difference in our way we treat eta and the way we treat phi? The phi is just a Higgs field or any other scalar field that might be a standard model. We don't know that I just want it. Maybe it's much more than I want. But, but what's the difference between the eta and the phi? Well, I don't see any difference in this Lagrangian. The only difference is the way I work that I, I, I choose eta, uh, well, to have a vector of station value which is imaginary. What it really means is that we have the functional infinite of the eta field, and normally we do it on the real line. If you do a functional, you integrate over a real line. But now we say no, 
we have a point way down the, uh, or up the imaginary axis, or down perhaps, if there's a minus sign. Yeah. That it's, it's, it's really way up in the, the, on, on the imaginary axis. There's a value, and you really have to uh, at the perturbation around the value. It's a little bit as if you replace this function integral by this function integral, and you go around that value where it is really imaginary. So a function integral should be replaced with such a kind of function integral. And, um, but you know that when you do integration, you can always move your orbits around. You have an integration contour that you chose any way you like. You have lots of freedom in choosing an integration contour. But for the Higgs field, you're always indicated on the real line, and the Higgs adaptation value is also on the real line, so, so you do your perturbation effect around that point. So, um, uh, but uh, for the Eta field, the information has so far is that it's somehow dominated by the value here on the imaginary uh, line, but that would be just a dynamical effect that shouldn't affect the fundamental way in which we treat those two fields. On the other hand, there is a very important difference in practice. So when we, when we follow the book the way it should normally be done, this eight field handled in a totally different way from the five field. And when I read things this way, I don't understand that difference anymore. Maybe it should be handled equally. But when you say that, you say something new. You say something that wasn't in the books. So, the important new theory, uh, or not theory, but theory, Eta and Phi are exactly alike. I don't see any difference in the fundamental formulation of equations, I see a huge difference in the way we work with the equations, but, um, uh, but as far as, um, as this these lines are concerned, it ought to, these fields ought to be identical. Now if so, then I have something new to add. There's something that wasn't there before. First of all, I say that if you Follow the book down further. Now we are going to look at the one loop quantum corrections because most of this argument has been classical. And classically, what happens is not clear. Classically, there's no difference between the eta field and the five field. Because quantum mechanically, there is. And the difference is very profound. The difference is that normally the eta constant or only fluctuating a little bit around the strange in the value. We are not considering as far as here. On the real axis. In particular, you never look very carefully that the eta goes all the way to zero. Zero lies very far away. When eta goes to zero, what happens in, according to the books if you, if you apply standard logic? If eta goes to zero, it means that omega goes to zero. That's just a multiplication by nonsense. So omega goes to zero. If omega goes to zero, I'm looking at the extremely small distance behavior. Because that tells you that ds squared is made to zero. I've been blowing up things and I've been looking at very small distance physics. And there was something about very small distance physics. If I look at distance scales small compared to the Planck length, standard theory says this is hell. We don't know what happens. We have nothing to say. And then they say something anyway. They say something that I can make a scale transformation in the standard model. I can consider the transformation x to lambda x. And that's here. If x goes to lambda x, eta goes to eta divided by lambda. So um, the phi field and, and the v's, they all change. This is ordinary scale transformation. So the scale transformation uh, will lead you to smaller and smaller or larger and larger eta. The scale transformation and bring you to the solar eta goes to zero. If I make such a transformation, 